Come on, give the Lord a shout. Got my coffee? Because it's going to be a long night. How's everybody doing tonight? Doing good? How's worship? Good? Amen. Man, I love Week of Fire. How many people have HBO? Anybody have HBO? A couple of people? How many people have seen Eastbound and Down? You need to repent right now. Um, how many of you know who Kenny Powers is on Eastbound and Down? He's here. Pastor Kenny Powers is here tonight. Pastor Lori Powers. Go ahead and stand up, guys, so everybody can say hi to you. From Wichita, just on the other side of El Centro. Not really. Wichita, Kansas. And uh, they're here with us. And, and uh, Pastor Kenny will be ministering tomorrow night. So you get to get that, amen. Don't, don't miss that, amen. It's going to be a great time. Great friends. Glad they're here. We'll, we'll tell you more about them. They've been here before. Some of you have had a chance to meet them before. And uh, they'll be ministering this week. And then Pastor Nati comes in tomorrow. And uh, for people who don't speak Spanish, his name is not Pastor Nati. It's Nati. And there's a difference, okay? He's an awesome guy. We'll have a great time with him as well. And we're going to have a good time in the Word tonight. And the word will require a response. And I'm not talking about cheering. I'm not talking about bucking and shouting. I'm talking about changing. Amen? So in about 30 minutes, I'm going to meet you right here. So pick your spot. Because you're coming. Got quiet in here, didn't it? We could fire, baby. Come on, let's pray. Father, thank you for this night. Thank you for an opportunity just to come to get refreshed, to get renewed, to lift up the name of Jesus. Lord, that you would be glorified to, Lord, that you would, would really fan the flame in our hearts, that you would fan the flames of revival, personal revival in our own lives. And, and Lord, that it wouldn't be about ministry, it wouldn't be about doing, but this week would be about being. And Lord, tonight we're just so thankful for the privilege that you've called us and, and allowed us to be your sons and daughters, that you've saved us. Jesus, that you died on the cross for us and, and you forgave us for our sins. You, you truly rescued us and gave us a life worth living. And, and Lord, we're so thankful. And tonight we want to set aside everything else so, so we can keep the main thing the main thing. So come and minister to us this week and help us to get our hearts right. Whatever level we're at, that we would go to the next level. That you would be glorified in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, well, I already started ministering to you a little bit um, on Saturday night, and I was giving you the, mess the message, really the message of week of fire, which is separation, say separation, separation. consecration, say consecration. consecration, and tonight we're going to talk about transformation, say transformation. transformation. Now, we have to separate from the world, right? We have to be different, but then we have to consecrate to God. So separating from isn't enough. Did you get that? Yeah. Separating from, like not doing, I'm not going to do bad things. How many people know that's necessary, but that's not the end. We are going to separate from, but then we have to also consecrate to. And that's a, there's a difference. Some people are legalists. They just, I just stopped doing this and I stopped doing that and I stopped doing that. That does not make you a Christian. It's who you're consecrated to is what makes you a disciple of Jesus. Now, the Israelites were slaves in Egypt for four, 400 years. <laughs> Excuse me, I felt like Hillary Clinton there for a second. <laughs> Only one second. Don't worry, that demon came out. So, you knew that I was going to get in there somehow. But they were slaves in Israel for 400 years. That's a long time. And they wanted to get free, and the Lord sent Moses and set them free, and then you know, the 10 plagues. How many people know the plagues were not a good time? How many people did not realize that the first six of the 10 plagues affected the Israelites as well as the Egyptians? That doesn't make it as much fun, does it? But the reality is they all had to live through it. But God used it 
to set them free. Now they got free. They're gone. The Lord parts the Red Sea. It was incredible. It was a miracle. Destroyed the armies of Pharaoh. Now we're on the other side. Guys, that's separation. We are now separated from Egypt. How many people were glad when you got set free from Egypt? And the Lord said, man, that is awesome. Meet me at Mount Sinai. He did not say, now you're free. Go do what you want. Now you're free. I got you off drugs. Now just go send good vibes to everybody. Now you're free. Go and be a good person. That's not what happened. He didn't say, man, I have always wanted you to be free. Actually, what he said was, you know, I always intended you to be a slave. You were just a slave to the world. You know, it's funny because people, they'll preach, and, and I don't have a problem with this sermon. They say, we're no, no longer slaves, we're sons. And, and that's true. But understand that Christianity and, and our life as a disciple is a, like a multifaceted diamond. There's different aspects. You've got to look at it, and, and you can't just look at one part. You, you really have to look at all of it to start to understand who we are. Does that make sense? And how many of you know we preach we are sons and daughters of the Most High God? We know that, right? Amen. Now watch this. But we're also slaves. And Paul chose to be a slave. Why? So other people could be free. And so Joshua, he had it figured out. He said, hey, choose this day whom you're going to serve. He didn't say choose this day if you'll serve. He said choose who. Make up your mind because you're going to serve somebody. You're going to worship somebody. Guys, you're going to be a slave to somebody. You don't want to be a slave to sin Romans says it's better to be a slave to righteousness. Amen? So the Red Sea was parted. They were set free. They were separated from. Separation. Boom. We're out. But they didn't get to go where they want. They went to Mount Sinai. Guess what was waiting at Mount Sinai? The Ten Commandments. God said, man, I freed you from the one you were in bondage to so I could enslave you to myself who freed you. So we're not free we're now slaves of God. See, we're separated from, but then we had to go to Mount Sinai to get consecrated to. Now I'm special for you. Pharaoh, check this out, owned them. How many people know that's the definition of slavery? And then the Lord said, no, nah, you can't own them. Those are my people. But they have to choose me even though I already chose them. You got to get that tonight. The Lord says, you didn't choose me, I chose you. But you have to choose to be chosen. The Lord says, man, you're my people, you're a slave. I don't want to be a slave. Yeah, but you, you quit before you got the good part. You're my people, but I'm your God. How many people know we get the better end of that deal? So it's separation from, we definitely have to come out, but how many people know when there's a coming out, there's a coming in? So we separate from, we consecrate to, and then we have to be changed. That's a transformation. Now there's a lot of things about changing, about discipleship, about, um, about our sanctification that leads to Christian maturity, but as it pertains to the week of fire for our church for this week, I'm gonna talk to you about transformation in a single sense that's not vague, that's not broad, but it's very simple and narrowed down so we know exactly what to do. I had a lady tell me one time in Indonesia, Indonesia they have very intelligent preachers and they preach real high and smart things and that's why I don't have a church in Indonesia because I'm not good at that. And I preached there at the big church, 5,000 people, and the pastor's a lady and she said to me, I don't mean this as disrespectful, but your preaching is very simple. And I said, I don't mean to be disrespectful, but that's on purpose. She said, yeah, it's simple, but we can do what you said. And therein lies the purpose of preaching. <laughs> Not to know, come on somebody, but to do. And she said, I don't even know what you're talking about, but we want to do what you said. Can you train us to do what you do? And I said, 
Yeah, but remember, it's going to be simple. <laughs> You're not going to get out with, I didn't understand. Some people are like, Christianity is so, it's difficult. It's so, you have to have these people that are so educated to teach. <laughs> no, man. Nah. Stop sinning. What's sin? Don't play that game, Jack. You know. You know when you gave your life to Jesus, that thing that you went to do that you felt terrible? Yeah, that's called conviction. Don't play the I didn't know game. That's not going to get it with Jesus. So that's what you need to stop doing. That's called separation. Well, yeah, I just don't really know what to do. I don't know what my calling, that's a lie. Jesus said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given unto me. Therefore, let me teach you about studying the Bible. Whenever you see the word therefore, look up to see what the therefore is there for. Because he's about to say something that's a result of what he said before that. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given unto me. How many people know that's a big statement? Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. Win souls and make disciples. Boom. Well, I don't know what I'm not supposed to do. Yes, you do. Well, I'm not sure what I'm called to do. Yes, you do. The problem is not in your understanding. The problem is in your obeying. Separation, stop doing it. Consecration, start doing it. Transformation, time to change your mind and your heart. What's the area that I think that we need the most? Well, I'm going to lead into it with a whole bunch of preaching. Leviticus chapter 16, verse 8 through 13 says this. Then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, command Aaron and his sons, saying this is the law for the burnt offering. The burnt offering itself shall remain on the hearth on the altar all night until the morning, and the fire on the altar is to be kept burning on it. Say kept burning. The priest is to put on his linen robe, and he shall put on the undergarments next to his flesh, he shall take up the ashes to which the fire reduces the burnt offering on the altar and place them beside the altar. Then he shall take off the garments and put on other garments and carry the ashes outside the camp to a clean place. How many people understand the Lord is giving very simple and clear instructions? Wear this, do this, change clothes, put that over there. Not that hard, right? These guys are about to get it wrong and they're about to get killed for it. Check this out, verse 12. The fire on the altar shall be kept burning. There it is again. It shall not go out, but the priest shall burn wood on it every morning and it shall uh, lay out the burnt offering on it and offer up in smoke the fat portions of the peace offerings on it. The fire shall be kept burning continually on the altar. It's not to go out. The fire is to be kept burning continually upon the altar and it shall not go out. That means there's always got to be fire on the altar. The fire, can, are you here? The fire cannot go out. Romans chapter 12, present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to the Lord, which is your reasonable spiritual service. Offer yourself, what? Myself is the offering, where? On the altar of my life. And then I have to keep the fire burning continually on the altar of my life, not sometimes, not on Saturday night, not once in a while when I decide to do my devotional, but my job is to keep the fire burning. Now in Leviticus chapter 10, verse one, Aaron's sons, Nadab and Abihu, put coals of fire in their incense burner and sprinkled incense over them. In this way, they disobeyed the Lord by burning before him the wrong kind of fire. A lot of people don't know there's different kinds of fire. I don't know about you, but I can start the fire on my stove. I can use a lighter. I can use lighter fluid. I have a barbecue grill. To me, it all seems like the same fire, right? Fire's fire. I mean, you got hotter fire and you got fire that's not, a flame that's not so hot. I mean, I didn't even know there was different kinds of fire, but apparently these guys offered the wrong kind of fire. And it says different than he had commanded. Verse two, so fire blazed forth from the Lord's presence. The Lord said, you need fire? I got some. How many people know that God's always got fire? Our God is 
a consuming fire. They're about to find out. So fire blazed forth from the Lord's presence and burned them up. And they died before the Lord. Then Moses said to Aaron, this is what the Lord meant. When he said, I will display my holiness through those who come near me. I will display my glory before all the people. And Aaron was silent. And you know what it goes on to say in the verses after that? And then the Lord said, and don't even cry. Don't even look sad. Make sure you comb your hair. Don't go outside of here. Don't even mourn for those guys. He's talking about his sons. God's like, this isn't a joke. It's not a game. I told you how to do it. You didn't do it. You ignored what I did. You tried to manufacture the fire of God. You tried to manufacture the anointing of God. You tried to manufacture the presence of God. You tried to fake it. And nobody's going to feel sorry when God said, if you needed fire, you just should have asked. What's the difference between the fire they offered and what God was asking for? Leviticus 9.23 and Moses, Moses and Aaron went into the tabernacle of the congregation, and then they came out, and they blessed the people, and the glory of the Lord appeared unto all the people. Verse 24, and there came a fire out from before the Lord, and it consumed upon the altar the burnt offering and the fat. And when all the people saw, they shouted and fell on their faces. You know why this is what happened? They dedicated the tabernacle to God. They dedicated it. They came outside. They blessed the people, and then the fire from heaven fell on the altar and consumed the sacrifice in front of the people. And God said, I receive it. Fire fell. When the fire fell, the people went, oh my God, we're not having church. God just showed up. And they didn't go, oh, praise the Lord. They were on their faces. Oh my God, the fire has broke out. And how many people know that God is an awesome God? He's a, an amazing and a scary God. And when he breaks out, everybody's not always cheering. They were like, "Woo! oh, on my face. I don't want God to kill me. In the inauguration of the traveling tabernacle of the Lord, the sacrifices placed on the altar of the burnt offering were accepted by the Lord and consumed by a fire that came from the glory of the Lord. How good is that? This was no ordinary fire. Come on, somebody. Did you get that? I told you there's different kinds of fire. I didn't know that. This was no ordinary fire. It was sacred fire, holy fire from God himself. This same fire was then used to burn the incense that was taken into the tabernacle to the altar of incense. Leviticus 16, verse 12. And he shall take a censer full of burning coals of fire from off the altar from before the Lord and his hands full of sweet incense beaten small and bring it within the veil. Leviticus 16, 13, and he shall put the incense upon the fire before the Lord that the cloud of the incense may cover the mercy seat that is upon the testimony that he die not. Notice or note that the smoke of the incense burning with the sacred fire from the Lord preserved the life of the priest while he was in the tabernacle. This was no small or trivial matter. Did you get that? Where did they get that fire? It fell from heaven. When, the, when they dedicated the tabernacle, they said, God, this is for you. And he said, you know what would be cool? If I provided the fire. Did you know natural fire goes up? Supernatural fire comes down. They said, God, we dedicate. He said, I receive it. And then it was on fire. And then he said, you see that fire right there? Keep that fire burning. Don't let that fire go out. There is no fire like that fire on the earth. You know, they literally, when they would pack up the tabernacle, they put that in, in a, a container and they had to carry the fire to keep it lit. And when they would set up the altar again, they lit the fire with the fire that fell from heaven. They had it with them wherever. They, how awesome is that? The fire that fell from heaven was different than any other fire in the earth. You cannot manufacture it. You cannot fake it. The fire of the Holy Spirit that fell on your life cannot be manufactured. You can't jump up and down and, and you can't try to serve and make people think you got it. You either got it or you don't. It came from God. You cannot manufacture it. You can't make the people around you think you have it. You either got it from God or you don't got it. And if you're offering fire and it didn't come from God, that's a strange fire. And the Bible says that when they offered those incense, that God recognized that it was strange fire. And he said, that's not the incense that I require. 
I don't know where you got that. But don't be bringing that janky A stuff up in here trying to offer me your fake religion, trying to act like you know me and you want everybody to see you bringing your sacrifice. And that's junk what you brought. And God said, you need fire? I got some. Oh, I'm sorry. Did that burn you up? And that's what God wants from us. He wants us to receive the fire from heaven and then it's our job to take care of what we receive from him. And to keep that fire burning where? In our heart, in our life, on the altar of our life. God, here's my life. I'm a sacrifice. This is my altar. Every day, I offer my worship to you, my incense. That's what the Bible says. What is incense? The Bible says that the angels come into the throne room of God with golden bowls full of the incense of the prayers of the saints. For us, the fire that needs to keep burning is our prayer life. Hey, tonight's not about learning some new thing that you didn't know. It's about doing something that we did know. We, as a church, me and you, people, not destiny, me and Brian Monty, Rich Whitmer, Brian Monty, me and you, we need to get that fire going. We can't manufacture it. We just have to meet God at the altar and say, hey, you know that fire you gave me? I let it go out. I know I was supposed to keep it burning, but I neglected it. It wasn't that I didn't love you. It's that sometimes I got busy. Sometimes I was selfish. Sometimes I just, I didn't pay attention. I was doing other things and then I looked back and the fire was gone. And I don't want to fake it. I really love you. And I'm right here. You did it before. Bring it. Bring, bring the fire from heaven. I, I don't want to play church. I don't, I don't want to try to look religious. I don't, I don't want to make anybody happy. I don't, it doesn't matter how many people I can fake out. I, I just want to meet you at the altar. And, and I'll be faithful with the fire you give me. How many people know God would love a prayer like that? He would never, look, if God is going to bring his fire in judgment, how much more would he bring his fire in mercy? John said that the one who came, he was talking about Jesus, he said, I'm not even worthy to unlatch his shoes. He's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. That's what he said. And Jesus said, how much better is is your heavenly father that even a good father, if you ask for a stone or a piece of bread, he's not going to give you a stone. He's not going to give you a scorpion. How much more will, the, will your heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? How much more if we come to the altar and say, God, I, I, and maybe, maybe it's there. Maybe some people, maybe it's still there, but maybe it's not how it was. And we know that Jesus is not going to snuff it out. The Bible says he fans it into a flame. That's what we need personally, not as a group, personally, right? Week of Fire is about me taking care of me, you taking care of you. I'm preaching to you, but I'm preaching to me. Do you hear me? Like, I, I'm not like, here's what the church needs, and I'm going to tell you. I, I'm part of this church. Lord, what do we need? This is what we need. I'm here with you. We personally need to receive that fire, and we need to keep that fire of prayer burning on our altar, offering the incense of prayer every day. Amen? Prayer is the way to keep the fire burning on the altar of our lives. Let me give you this great definition of prayer. You're going to like this. Oh, don't worry. I'm going to give you some good teaching, and then we're going to go back to you feeling like you feel right now. Definition of prayer. To ask that the laws of the universe be annulled in behalf of a single petitioner, confessed unworthy. Think about what that's saying. That we're asking God, all the laws of the universe, don't count those. Change them for me, even though I know I'm not worthy. That's what prayer, how good is that? Man, that's a great definition of prayer. God, can you come in and change 
the universe, the laws, the rules. Can you change all that for me? And by the way, I know I'm not worth it, but I'm asking. That's prayer right there. Hebrews 4.16. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Man, if we look at that verse, guys, we need to come to God because everything we need is right there in that verse. Listen to this. Let us approach God's throne of grace with confidence. Why? So that we may receive mercy. How many people can use some mercy? And find grace. How many people need grace? To help us in our time of need. How many people right now would say, in some area of my life, I'm in a time of need? Everybody. God knows that. And he says, listen, come in confidence. Approach me by the blood of my son. Just come and I'll give you mercy and I'll give you grace and I'll help you in your time of need. And then we say, yeah, but we're busy right now. The Lord's like, no, you're, you're not busy. Come over here. I want to help you. You're busy running around trying to fix things that I want to fix. You're busy trying to be in control. Charles Finney said this, a revival may be, how many people want a revival? Well, let me define it first. How many people want a personal revival? Because to be honest, if we don't have a personal revival, what sense is a revival outside us if there's not a revival inside of us, right? Finney said, a revival may be expected when Christians have a spirit of prayer for revival. Let's say the opposite of that. A revival may not be expected when Christians do not have a spirit of prayer for revival. How many people are going to meet me here tomorrow morning for prayer? How many of you were not here this morning? Me either. I know it sounds terrible. I totally forgot. <laughs> God, this is so bad. I literally slept right through. I was like, week of fire, man. It's starting tonight. I'm going to sleep in. Mondays are usually my day off. I was like, I'm going to sleep in. I'm going to rest. I'm going to read. I'm going to, I miss prayer. I'm the worst pastor that ever lived in the history of the world. And so now you know why I'm preaching this. It's out of guilt. This is my guilt offering to God. But really, I was thinking, well, week of fire starts tonight. We'll get grace on today. But tomorrow, guys, not for revival for the city. Revival for us. Let's do it. You know if you can't be here, and you know if you can. Argue with Jesus. <laughs> he says, that is when they pray as if their hearts were set upon it. When Christians have the spirit of prayer for revival. When they go about groaning about their heart's desire. When they have real travail of soul. And this is when it gets tricky because sometimes we can't care. Have you ever been in that place? It's like, God, I want to pray, but the truth is, I don't want to want to. You got to really want it. Yeah, but I'm not sure if I want it. That's why we have week of fire. So you can get your want to back. How many people know without the want to, it's not going to happen? Look, you want to. You know what happens? We get distracted with life. How many people know life is distracting? It's like, God, if we weren't in this world, we could love you. He's like, I know, I'm working on it. <laughs> Woodrow Kroll said this, fervent prayers produce phenomenal results. Man, somebody, a friend messaged me that I haven't talked to in a while on Facebook and said, when you prayed for my dad in 2011, he got cured of cancer. He's still cancer free. Yeah, somebody thank Jesus for that. How many people know that it don't matter who prayed, it matters who answers the prayer. Come on, somebody. But fervent prayers produce phenomenal results. You know, it's like, why doesn't everybody that you pray for get healed? I don't know. But some of them do. We're going to keep on praying. We're going to keep on believing. Some get healed early and some get healed later. 
but we're all in the process of being healed. Amen? R.A. Torrey said this, when the devil sees a man or a woman who really believes in prayer, who knows how to pray, and who really does pray, check out those requirements. Did you get that? They believe, they know how, and they really do. It, it requires all of those. And it says, and above all, when he sees a whole church, are you here? On its face before God in prayer, the devil trembles as much as he ever did, for he knows that his day in that church or a community is at an end. How many people know we need to be here tomorrow morning? If we want revival in our lives, we have to pray. It's funny because this isn't a funny topic, but people's response is funny. People are people, you know. Had a heart attack, go to the doctor. Doctor says, hey, can't eat that stuff. Yeah, I'm trying. You ain't trying, baby. You're dying. Like, ain't no trying. How many people know at that point, you better get serious? I remember I went to the gym and I had a trainer. It was a long time ago. And I said to my trainer, I said, well, I want this and that. And he says, 80% of everything we do is diet. I'm like, I hate your guts. Do I really pay that much money to come here and, and hear what I already knew? Welcome to Week of Fire. <laughs> Did I really take my Monday night, Miss Monday Night Football, so I could come here and pass Rich tell me I need to pray? I know I need to pray. I don't want to. <laughs> See why we have Week of Fire during Week of Fire? If we had this on Saturday night, nobody would come back. See, we start out like this on Monday, and it gets nicer as we go. We're like, please come back next. No, not really. It's going to get worse. <laughs> James 5.16 says, the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man gets stuff done. That's what that says. Isn't that good? It makes things happen. You know, I, I probably am the person that has believed the least and the most in prayer of anybody you know. I think I'm probably schizophrenic. There are times that I feel like prayer is not doing anything. And there's times that I know prayer is like shaking the, the gates of hell. It's so crazy. It's like sometimes we act like we don't know where we're at. You know what? Prayer is an act of faith. It doesn't matter what you're feeling. It matters that it's true. And we need to do it. And when you don't feel like doing it, you need to do it more than when you do feel like doing it. And you know what's funny is people say, I, I've never heard anybody say, I pray enough. I've never heard anybody say that. Because the more you pray, the more you realize you need to pray. It's like being humble. The more humble you are, the more humble you realize you're not. And the second that you realize you're humble, you're not humble anymore. You missed it. That's how prayer is. We have to pray. And we need to pray. And we need to be here to pray. We need to pray together. We need to pray individually. We need to pray with our life groups. We need to pray for real. Real prayer. Amen? And we need to pray believing. And we need to pray expecting. And then when something happens, we need to tell people that God answered our prayer. I know I'm telling you a lot of stories. I'm giving you verses and I'm giving you stories. I'm giving you instruction and inspiration at the same time. And then we're going to pray. <laughs> so many people know it's dumb to talk about it and then not do it. It doesn't even make sense. People preach on baptism of the Holy Spirit and they don't give anybody a chance to get baptized in the Holy Spirit. Like that doesn't make any sense. Andrew Murray said this. A woman, or this is a story about Andrew Murray. A woman went to Andrew Murray with the problem of feeling like she couldn't pray. Have you ever felt like that? You can even raise your hand if you feel like that today. <laughs> You're like, that's me. He said, why then do you not try this? As you go to your inner chamber, however cold and dark your heart may be, do not try in your own might to force yourself into the right attitude. Bow before him and tell him that he sees in what a sad state that you are and that your only hope is in him. Trust him with a childlike trust to have mercy upon you and wait upon him. In such a trust, you are in a right relationship with him. You have nothing, he has everything. Some people think, I don't know how to pray, I can't pray, I don't feel like praying. Man, there it is. Well, I don't feel like praying, what do I do? Go and tell God, God, here I am. I don't feel like praying. It's, I'm not doing good. I don't feel like I'm getting results. Maybe I'm, I'm too carnal. I don't, it's not my answer. I mean, he knows anyway. 
And here I am. I have nothing. You have everything. What do I do? And then be quiet. How many people know he'll show up? He will. God, I need that fire from heaven. He's going to answer that prayer. He's going to answer that prayer. The woman later told Murray that his advice had helped her. She discovered that her trust in Christ's love for her could help her pray, even when prayer did not come easy. Man, prayer is not easy. Prayer is that, you know, I, I, keep, I go back to the gym because it's like going to the gym. You know when you're in a routine, you're going to the gym? And you, you're like, no. <laughs> and you feel good. You're like, man, I'm going to the gym. Woo! And you get in this habit. And then all you have to do is stop for like three or four days. You're like, here I go again. And it's this hard thing. It's terrible. It's like hell. And then you see people that go to the gym every day, and they're in there having a great time. Like, isn't this great? And you're like, shut up. It's not great. I quit just enough days to build up all the lactic acid back in my body so I can feel like hell tomorrow. You probably don't say that, but I think it. Prayers like that. You start praying, you're working your faith muscle, you're, work, you're working out spiritually, you're doing it. You're like, man, this is who I am, this is what I do. I'm in the presence of God, I'm gonna talk to him, he's gonna talk to me, I'm gonna get answers to prayer, he's gonna tell me what to do. I'm gonna listen, here I am, and this is, man, it's great to be here. And somebody that doesn't pray comes and goes, I hate you, look how happy you are in prayer. And you're like, just sit there for a little while, those demons will come out. <laughs> sit there. Sometimes we need to just get there. You just gotta get there. So your flesh hates it. Well, it's time to get up early and go pray. No. And then once you get here, you're like, man, I'm so glad I'm here. I've had times where I come to prayer, and you might say that this is not praying. I would disagree with you, but you can think whatever you want about me. I'll sit right there and I won't do anything. Here I am, Jesus. And I'll sit there for half an hour just like that, listening to worship music. I, I don't care. I'm in the presence of God. Good enough. Thanks, Lord. See you tomorrow. Sometimes that's what I got. Sometimes I just need to be there. Sometimes I'm just there to receive. I'm there to listen. And sometimes you'll see me on my phone. You're like, man, you're just texting away. And I'm not texting. I'm right. Sometimes God just tells me stuff. Sometimes as I pray for people, God's telling me something. Write it down. I'm not just talking. I'm listening. Right? Guys, I think we turn it into this, we, it has to be some performance. It doesn't have to be a performance. Come and get with God. Come and get with him. God, I'm here with you. What are we going to do today? Well, this routine in our mind of what we're supposed to do. How about what, when you go meet your friends, sometimes you have a plan. Sometimes you're like, what do you want to do? I don't know. What do you want to do? And that's a great time unless it's two phlegmatics and you drive around town. And not, <laughs> nothing gets done. You run out of gas. You forgot to get it. I don't know. But... It's fun when you get together with somebody and you figure out what you're going to do. And you know what? Sometimes we just need to get with God and be like, what are we going to do today? Sometimes you have a plan. God, here's some things I need to talk to you about right here. I have my prayer list. We always have people, our family and, and people that we're praying for. We're going to pray for those people. But sometimes, God, what, what do you want to talk about? What do you want to tell me about? Here's some things I need to tell you about. Stop making it a ritual and start making it a lifestyle. Let's just show up and meet with him and see what he's going to do. God can tell you amazing things. I'll tell you something. This, when we first started the church, and man, I, I would study. I love to study. And, and even before I started pastoring, I would just read and study, and I loved it. It was so much fun. And I would prepare sermons to death. And then I would preach, really, a four-part series in 50 minutes. It was way too much information for anybody. And I was like, yeah, and I'd run out of there fired up. You know? Nobody got anything. But I remember one night I was getting ready. My office was in town and the church, we were meeting at a church over here that we rented. And I had my sermon. I was kind of proud of it. You know, not in a bad way. Not like, but I was like, there it is. I've worked on this all week. Oh, I'm ready to go, man. Woo! And the Lord said, don't preach that. And I was like, excuse me? <laughs> Maybe you didn't see how much time I spent on that. And the Lord told me, don't preach that. And I was like, okay, well, what do you want me to preach? Because I figured it was something. And the Lord said, just Go ahead and leave your notes there and go to church and I'll tell you. And I was like, oh, heck no. And literally, I'm telling you, the Lord told me not to preach it and to leave it there. And I was not happy. So I was driving to church and I was praying all the way because I knew the Lord would tell me on the way. Nope. Get to church. We're standing in worship. Everybody else is worshiping. I'm like, Jesus, hurry up. 
up. I don't even have time to look up verses right now. I was like losing my mind. I'm serious. And it wasn't like I could get on my phone. This is flip phone time, guys. This is not like smartphone. This is flip phone. Like, I can't even help you. You, you text somebody, it'll take you 20 minutes to say, help. You know what I mean? It doesn't do anything. And so I'm just standing there worshiping. I'm like, oh, Jesus. And not in a good way. I was like, oh, Jesus. And then they're doing offering. I literally have no message. And I told the Lord, fine. If your goal is to have me go up there and look stupid, you want to humble me? Fine, I'll get up there and be humble, but I'm blaming it on you. I told the Lord, I said, I am going to get up there and tell the church the Lord told me to leave my notes. Here I am, and I don't have anything to say. You don't know how hard it is being me. (laughs) Apparently, the Lord has issues with me. And so as I was getting ready to go up there, literally going to walk up, the Lord says, preach on Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. I was like, what? And I was like, where is that? <laughs> so I know it's in the book of Acts. I'm trying to find it. I'm seriously like, okay, Pastor, I'm like, hold on, let me find I got, I don't even know where the verses are that I'm supposed to preach on. So I find the verses, I open it up, and I'm going to read the verses. I have no idea what I'm going to say. I've not preached on it before. I have not a clue. And I start reading the story. As I start reading the story, the Holy Spirit starts talking to me, starts giving me points, revelation, cross-references, verses, stuff I had never preached. I was standing there learning. Guys, we have limited God to what we think he can do, and he wants to do all kinds of stuff with us. He wants us to trust him. Amen? And you know what the Lord told me? He said, I'm going to put you in situations where you're not going to be prepared. You need to trust me. I was like, oh, that wasn't about preaching. That was about my life. Guys, God's putting us in situations that are impossible because he wants us to come to him and say, I need you. And he's waiting to show up. He's waiting to show up and show you what to do, to show up and blow up on your behalf. Come on, that's the God that we serve. Amen? Amen. But we don't want to be in that situation. We spend our life trying to reduce our need of God. I wish I had enough money that I never had to work again. Because then I wouldn't have to pray about paying bills. I wish I had this and I wish I had that. And then we're trying to reduce our need of God. Except for there's a problem with that. The Bible says, my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. And so what we need is not to reduce our need. We need to need more need. We need to put ourselves in more situation where we need him and he's going to supply all of our need. Amen? So let's separate ourselves from sin, from the world's mindsets and behaviors. Let's consecrate ourselves to God so that we're special for his use. And let's be transformed and see the transformation in others through prayer. I'm going to tell you this story. And after this story, I'm going to pray for you. We're going to open up the altar. Get the worship team up here. They're coming. Um, we're going to open up the altar. I want you to come and pray. And I don't want you to come and pray. We're not going to pray loud and try to make a scene and pretend we're at a conference. Okay? Not shooting video, trying to impress anybody. I don't care about that. We don't need corporate fire right now. We need individual fire. So what I want us to do is I just want us to, to pray. If you can't come to the altar, you can pray where you're at. That's fine. But, but the altar's open, and it's a great place to meet God. And I want you to just be honest with the Lord and say, here I am. This is the condition of my prayer life. This is the condition of the fire in my heart. Because remember, we are a kingdom of priests, amen? And it is our job to keep the fire burning. Okay, when I say our, I mean individually, each one of us. It's our own responsibility to keep the fire of God burning in our heart, right? And the way we do that is through prayer. So just like I was sharing about the lady who talked to Andrew Murray, maybe you just need to tell the Lord, Lord, I, I can't even pray. I don't even know what to do. Here I am. Can you help me? And just listen to the Lord. Let's do that. He can show up. Guys, we don't, we don't have to whoop it up. We don't have to manufacture his presence. I don't have to go push people down. We don't, we don't have to worship ourselves into an emotional frenzy. We don't, we don't have to do, we don't have to manufacture anything. All we have to do is stand before a living God and be honest with him and say, this is where I'm at. My life is on your altar right now. Bring your fire from heaven again. I need that godly fire to come down on my life. Lord, light that fire again, and I'm going to be, I'm going to be more careful with it this time. I, I'm going to keep it burning every day this time. I'm going to take care of that fire. You know why? Because I love you. Look, you're here because you love him. You're here because you love him. 
Guilt always drives you away. Conviction always brings you to him. Don't let the devil lie to you and, and make you feel bad about it. You know what? You're here because you love God. Maybe you're not even living right, but you're here. Why the heck would you come tonight if you're not living right and you don't care? It's because you do care. This is your chance to just come and say, God, you know me. You know me. But here I am anyway. Can, can I have your fire again? And let him answer that prayer. And he will. Guys, and individually, when we do that, because that's what we're doing at Week of Fire. When we do that, man, you know what that means for, for us as a church? We're better for each other. We're better for our families. We're better for the community. Amen? And that's what we want. But we got, the fire's got to start here. We can't manufacture it and try to take it out there. It's going to start right here. And we get that fire. What happens when you dedicate the temple? The fire falls. Amen? Come on, let's be standing. I want to read this story. In one region of Africa, the first converts to Christianity were very diligent about praying. In fact, the believers each had their own special place outside the village where they went to pray in solitude. The villagers reached those prayer rooms by using their own private footpath through the brush. When grass began to grow over one of these trails, it was evident that the person to whom it belonged was not praying very much. Did you get that? Every day, they would walk out to pray in private. And, and as they went, because it was every day, it wore out a path. And there were all these paths leading out, leading out of the village where people were going to pray. Isn't that cool? But if you didn't go to pray, the grass started to grow on the path and people could see it. Listen to this. Because these new, these new Christians, because these new Christians were concerned for each other's spiritual warfare, a unique custom sprang up. Whenever anyone noticed an overgrown prayer path, he or she would go to the person and lovingly warn, friend, there's grass on your path. That's what we're doing tonight. We all have our place that we go to prayer. Maybe we don't walk and have a physical path that people can see, but I think we're here tonight and we're here together to tell each other, friend, there's grass on your path. It's time to start walking that prayer life back out. It's time to walk it back out. It's time to get that fire from God and to keep that fire burning. Amen. That's how we keep our life on the altar. Guys, we are a church that's founded on prayer. I, I know many people are convicted tonight. That's why we have week of fire. Because if we don't stop and take care of our own business, we can't keep doing God's business. So that's what we're here for. You're not responsible for anybody else in the church tonight. It doesn't matter any leader that's here. You're not responsible for anybody. You are responsible for you. And tonight, we're going to take care of our own prayer life. We're going to get our fire back at the altar. And we're going to start walking that out. It's a foundation not only of our church, but of Christianity. It's a strong prayer life. Amen. Come on, let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word tonight. Thank you for every person that's here. For your incredible love that you have for us, that you've given us the blessing of the Holy Spirit to bring conviction to our lives, but Lord, that you never push us away. You always bring us closer and you're always drawing us closer. You always wanna be more with us, Lord. It, it doesn't matter how far we go or what we do, you're always reaching out, trying to bring us back closer to your heart. And tonight, Lord, we offer our hearts to you. Lord, individually and as a church, we're asking, Lord, that you would return your fire to the altar of our hearts tonight. Help us, Lord, to be people of prayer. Lord, we pray tonight asking that you would help us to pray. Our spirit's willing, our flesh is weak. Tonight, we ask that you would help us, Holy Spirit, by your grace, empower us because it is our heart's desire to be people of prayer. We love you so much, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, the altar's open tonight. You can come up to the front. Come on, we can come and do business with God. You know, one time there was a 
a woman that was telling me that nothing incredible gets done without prayer. And I remember it was at a time when I was super busy and I was traveling a lot and God was doing miracles and incredible things. And I was thinking, well, that's kind of not true because God's been doing all these things and I haven't been praying. I haven't had time. I've been so busy. And, and it wasn't that I was proud of that. I just thought, I haven't been praying and God's doing a lot of great things. I thought it. I literally thought it in one second. And you know what she said? And if God is doing something and you're not praying, it's because somebody else is praying. Man, I got so convicted and I thought, I was, one hand I was thankful, the other side I was convicted. One hand I was thankful that, that when I was weak that somebody else was carrying me. When I wasn't taking care of my responsibility, somebody was praying for me. But then I thought, it's not a good way to live our life that we're not taking care of our responsibility that that we need to offer ourselves to God in prayer not just for ourselves but also for others that we are the ones that need to contribute let's pray for other people some people can't pray they wish they can and they can't and you know what we can we can pray you can pray you can do it you can make a difference no matter what you can't do you can pray you can pray God can do something in your life but he can also use you to unleash the glory of heaven on somebody else's life we can pray we can pray come on receive that right now by the spirit of god lord let your fire from heaven fall right now on the altar of our hearts lord we dedicate our temples we are the temple of the holy spirit and we dedicate our temples to you tonight afresh lord show that you accept our sacrifice and let your fire fall in our hearts light that fire again bring the fire from heaven lord lord bring that fire from heaven we'll be more faithful with that fire we'll take care of it and lord we'll use it to offer the incense of prayer in our lives every day unto you lord for those of us that have struggled with prayer lord i just ask right now that you would encourage and strengthen us and by your grace you would empower us you Lord, you know the desires of our heart tonight. It is to pray. It is to pray. Lord, help us to pray. Help us to pray. Help us to pray by your grace, Lord, that we could receive the things that you have for us and for others, Lord, that we would be intercessors in prayer, praying for our kids, Lord, more, praying for our friends more, praying for our families, praying for our neighbors, Lord, even praying for our enemies in the name of Jesus. Let us be people of prayer. Let your anointing fall on us, Lord, that we would be known as a people of prayer. Let that fire fall from heaven tonight. Let that fire fall from heaven tonight. Come on, just stay there for a few more minutes. Just, just loving God. Come on, that's prayer right now. What you're doing right now, you're in the presence of God. You're praying. Man, God is touching you right now. He's healing you right now. He's delivering you right now. He's setting you free. He's helping you to renew your mind right now. He's pulling some crazy things out of your mind right now. He's putting some incredible things in your heart right now. Come on, that's what he does when we meet him at the altar. He does something incredible in our life. Come on, he's giving you victory in your life right now in the name of Jesus. Come on, do not worry, but all things by prayer and supplication. Stop worrying, start praying. Come on, stop worrying, start praying. God wants to answer on your behalf. The Bible says that his eyes roam to and fro throughout the whole earth, looking for those that love him so, so he can show himself strong on their behalf. He wants to show himself strong on your behalf. He loves you. He loves you. He loves you. Lord, let your blood wash over us right now in the name of Jesus as we turn away from the things of the world. Come on, separate yourself from the things of the world right now. Lord, forgive us for our sins. We thank you that if we confess our sins, that you are faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Come on, we're being separated from the world. We're coming out of Egypt right now in the name of Jesus. Come on, you're passing through the Red Sea right now. Come on, you're, getting, you're going through that baptism of the Holy Spirit. You're going through the Red Sea. You're, you're getting set free. Your enemies are drowning behind you. Come on, they can't even follow you. When you go into the presence of God and the promise of God, the devil can't even follow you where you're going. Come on, we're being separated and we're also being consecrated. 
Come on, we're going to be used for God's purpose. God, we love you. We want you to use us, Lord, to love people, to be a blessing to people. Come on, you were born for the purposes of God and the kingdom of God. You love the Lord and you love people. Come on, you're set free right now. No more unforgiveness right now in Jesus' name. No unforgiveness. Come on, in Jesus' name, let those things go. Let that blood, just let it wash over you right now. Come on, it's bringing healing. When we consecrate ourselves to the Lord, it brings healing to our souls. And Lord, we receive transformation through prayer in the name of Jesus. We commit ourselves to prayer. Come on with your heads bowed and your eyes closed. Just for a moment, I want you to receive this. Listen, let me pastor you for a minute. This is week of fire. Now, I know some of you have to be at work even before that time, but the church is open from 5 to 7. Get here for 30 minutes. Get here for 30 minutes. If you sit here and do your devotional in that time, I don't care. We're not making a law about it. It's, it's to help you. It's to help you jumpstart. It's like get back going to the gym. It's, we're just helping you jumpstart it. Tuesday through Friday, four days. Come on, get in here. If you can get here, get here, and let's just pray. You don't have to pray with anybody else. The music will be on. You can sit in the chair. You can spend time with Jesus. Just spend a little bit of time with Jesus. Come on, let's do that. Let's commit to that. And remember, this is not about, it's not about numbers and how many people we can get to prayer. We don't care about that. It's about you. It's about getting you to prayer. It's about getting me to prayer. It's about us coming and just saying, Jesus, here we are in your presence. Come on, we could do it, guys. We could do it. That's what week of fire is. Let's sanctify ourselves to the Lord in the morning. Let's come here in the evening and let's get a word from God for our lives. He's going to do it. Come on. This is our week to renew ourselves and to get that personal revival in our lives. Lord, we love you.